right here along this trail. This is a trail going off my homestead, very near the brook. These are the tracks of a feral cat, and it comes by the cottage. It probably eats scraps that we throw out. There's one or two of them. It comes by the cottage regularly. And these are excellent, excellent examples of feline tracks. He stepped in this ice. These tracks are, a, well, are about a day old. Yesterday it was warm and there was a little bit of melting and then it suddenly turned cold and we got a dusting of snow. And so what happened was he stepped in these tracks and it froze almost perfect imprints of his front and back feet. He's taking a step here, front paw, back paw, that's why they're side beside each other. And then the dusting of snow blew just a little bit of snow into the tracks and it's essentially made prints and negative. What great samples of tracks. In this domestic cat's track movement pattern, it looks like he has two legs. See, there's paw left, paw right, paw left, paw right. But right here, we we'll get a great illustration of what's actually happening. He's stepping paw in paw. Now that's very typical when quadrupeds walk, especially if they're walking over softer ground. And yesterday this ice here where I'm standing was a bit mushy. But that's very typical. They step paw in paw. And cats are particularly secretive. All cats, domestic cats, wild cats, they're very secretive. And they will do their best to minimize their trails. Attract cats, cougars, lynx, bobcats and you can follow them and suddenly poof it's as if their spore vanishes as if they're ghosts they're very very good at hiding their own trails though most quadrupeds have this kind of movement pattern so what you're seeing here this is very very typical very standard quadruped movement when the quadruped is walking back paw into front paw back paw into front paw Typical walking gait movement. So there's Will-O-Wisp right up there. We're going to take a look at his tracks. Here once again, Will-O-Wisp of course being a dog is a canine. Just going to spin around so I'm not blocking the prints that I want to show you with my own shadow. Notice his movement. Paw and paw, paw and paw. Back to front, back to front. Here we resume. Right after we get past the place where the vehicles passed on this dirt road. Paw and paw, paw and paw, paw and paw, paw and paw. But a slight disruption of the paw and paw. And the slight disruption is because the dog is moving at an easy trot as opposed to a walk. You can tell it's an easy trot because the, spe because the prints are almost two feet apart and Will-O-Wisp is about a 70 pound dog. So his he has big paws, his prints would give his prints would give the impression of a somewhat larger canine. But he's moving at an easy trot. If he was just walking, his prints would be closer. But his walk, he's a quadruped, as are all dogs and cats and so on. They move paw and paw, paw and paw. One might think that this was a biped, such as a human, because we always just leave two tracks behind us. But quadrupeds have very different movement patterns. Here's a good example. His paw and paw here is a little out of place. Here we can see a back paw stepping into a front paw and the front paws in front. Now the reason it's out of place is because he's going at a trot. If he was moving at a walk, they would be almost perfectly paw and paw. But he's not moving at a walk here, he's moving at a slow trot. If he were to accelerate, this would evolve into a rotary gallop. And if he were to accelerate even further, then this would evolve into a full-scale gallop. You can learn a lot about tracking from observing the movements of domestic animals. What you cannot learn from domestic animals is behavior patterns. Wild animals have very, very different behavior patterns. They tend to prefer straight lines unless they're actively stalking because wild animals, unlike domestic animals, have to think about conservation of energy. They have to conserve calories. Their movements are efficient. They tend to move directly from point A to point B. If something catches their interest, 
some place where they think they might be able to get food, water, sex, shelter, perhaps a territorial dispute. They'll deviate in that direction, but even the deviation is pretty direct. They tend to turn sharply and move in that direction. If they're on the trail or something, they may, they may deviate a bit more for various reasons to make it look as if they're not trailing something, if they're a particularly intelligent pack hunter, such as a wolf, or they may deviate a bit more if they're uncertain of where the trail goes, so they're just scoping out the area to learn where the trail goes. But primarily the movement characteristics of wild animals are quite direct from one point of interest to the next. Here we have will west doing a slow trot, easy trot. Notice the movement, paw and paw, almost. Let's go back and retrace his steps. Especially since he's choosing to walk, as most animals do, on the easiest ground. So we're not getting a good trail, but see, paw and paw, paw and paw. Right here, paw and paw. Very typical quadruped movement pattern during a walk or an easy trot. Makes it look almost like as if they were bipedal. But quadrupeds do not move their legs as if they had two sets of legs, a pair working front and a pair working back, making coordinated tracks. Their movements are asymmetrical. And the most symmetric they get is during the walk when they're stepping paw and paw. As soon as they start to accelerate even a little, they become asymmetrical. Good boy, come on, let's go buddy. There he is, right here. Paw and paw, paw and paw, paw and paw. Easy trot, right here in some snow where we could track it. Wisp is continuing his easy trot and the reason he's doing it so much is for all toe walking quadrupeds at least all the ones I'm familiar with and I've tracked down a great many creatures in North America Central America for all toe walking quadrupeds the trot is their natural gait could be an easy trot just a little faster than a walk could be a fast trot but that's their natural gait that's their sort of at rest or leisure gait Whereas foot walkers, creatures that don't walk on their toes, such as humans or bears, for us, the walk or the amble is our more natural gait. That's why we move slower. We have a more careful gait. In many ways, we are much more sure-footed. That's why we can climb quite easily. But toe walkers are faster by nature. It's as if they have shock absorbers in their legs. They get around very quickly and easily and their natural gait is considerably faster than ours. This is why dogs are always having to be slowed down so that they don't leave us behind. You might notice I'm getting distracted here because I've come across this set of tracks. These tracks here have a long pad, large feet, substantial claws, No tail though, at first I was tempted to think this was an otter, but there is no tail drag and that would show even in this very, very shallow snow. Only three paws showing, this is an easy rotary gallop of a smallish animal. I would be inclined to say it's a coyote, except the spacing between the prints it's too close together. Perhaps this is a porcupine making an easy rotary gallop. They don't often do that, but they might have if they were spooked by something. Perhaps they saw the headlights of a car incoming. Something else had them spooked. I can't think of what else would have done this. But this is a big part of tracking what I'm doing right now. Tracking is not about looking at a set of prints and going, oh, this is that animal. Tracking is often about looking at spore that is very undefined. We don't have any real definition in these prints. We don't have any pad showing, any claw marks, any toes, any chevrons, not even negative space. There's virtually nothing to identify this. What I can tell from this 
asymmetrical three print pattern is that this is a rotary gallop for an animal though to make a rotary gallop and have a distance between a space and have a distance between the print sets of only about a foot it would have to be a very small animal that animal would be no larger than a raccoon or a porcupine I suppose this could have been done as well by a fisher the prints are about the right size we're on the outside edge of fisher territory but we do get them here this is an area where mink fishers martins and otters all mingle we're in kind of a borderline region here we get bobcats and lynx that's also rare we get deer and moose we get many animals that mingle in this eco zone which is halfway between temperate and boreal came out of there so anything could have happened across this old seldom used dirt road made it to the stream here and then of course we're gonna lose the trail in the stream and it could have continued in the water especially if it was an otter or a mink so we would have no further trail to follow it certainly is not continued on the other side it didn't even get up on the bank right over there Oh, well, that's about all we can tell from this one. This will be a mystery animal. An old forest on the backside of Twa Corby's Hollow. This is one of my favorite places. You don't see woods like this much in Nova Scotia anymore. I'm on an old, old logging trail. And right here, you can see the very small set of tracks here. As a forest rodent, works his way across moving in that direction into the woods on the other side I actually feel bad for the rodents this year because normally there's quite a bit of snow on the ground by now and they require that snow that's that that creates they live underneath the snow usually when the snow falls it leaves a small space underneath an inch or two deep referred to as the subnivian environment and it's warm because snow is an excellent insulator and they can continue living and foraging underneath that snow and do it pretty safe from predators except for shrews and things and the occasional passing fox or coyote that might hear them and remove them but the reason I can tell this animal is moving in that direction is because here here you can see tail marks it's getting behind its tracks it has a long tail so this is not a vole voles have short tails this is probably a forest mouse. We have various kinds of mice back here in the woods. I'm following old tracks. This looks like a very, very large buck to me. I walked through here yesterday. And something else was on its trail, something with larger prints. Maybe a coyote was sniffing behind it. You can barely see the tracks camera might not show them up too well at all. Here they are here, here. Those cameras don't catch contrast nearly as well as the human eye. But it was much later that the predator picked up its trail. I assume at this point that the predator was a large coyote, a single coyote. I haven't seen evidence of more spore of the predator yet. But I know that it was much later that its trail was picked up because the deer was only walking, so it wasn't alarmed. Here we have some more defined prints up here. And right here, they're about four feet between that track and that track. So we have a group there, alpha and beta, alpha, beta, just trotting. Easy pace, so it's not alarmed. Here we have the small animals, more substantial tracks, and no tail mark behind it. So this could well be a vole here. There are many types of rodents back here in these woods. It's a great old dead maple. It died two or three years back, just up there. For me, it's a great source of various fungi. Mostly, as the weather is becoming cool lately, I'm finding, I'm finding the small green oyster-shaped fungi that are sometimes called late oysters. They taste a lot like oysters, slightly bitter, but you don't even notice it when you cook them right as in pasta sauces, something to give them a little tartness. Very easy to identify, very good mushrooms. Got a grouse right there.
Good day to be alive. Good day to be in the woods. Well, Mr. Grouse or Miss Grouse, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disturb you. There's another one just over there. Came across a small flock. But I'm going to go by and that's going to set it to flying. Notice how still it is and the quality of its camouflage. It's trying to be a stick. If I hadn't seen it fly up there, I would probably have missed it entirely. That pale, freckled camouflage blends in quite nicely with the maple that it's sitting on. It's getting suspicious that I'm watching it. It's very subtly checking in this direction here and there. Pretty soon it's going to fly. I'll try to move on and see if I can avoid disturbing him anymore. Nope, there he goes. Sorry, Grouse. Did not mean to disturb you. Temperature is dropping fast as the sun moves toward the west over there. It's probably no more than zero Fahrenheit right now. And that's going to be death to the battery in this camera pretty soon. I'm keeping it under my coat, but even then, pulling it out to film is going to put an end to my filming efforts pretty shortly. I have a spare battery with me, but... It'll be chilled by the time I put it in there. I might get 15 or 20 minutes video out of it, if I'm lucky. However, I thought it was worth pulling out the camera to show these tracks. It's a very tiny, an inch in diameter, an inch across. Each set is an inch across widthwise at most. It's a common mouse in the forest. It's very active back here in the forest today. Those prints there, that's just Will-O-Wisp, but he's walked over that deer that I've been tracking now for close to a mile. And the coyote that was behind it has stayed with him for a while. And just on this side, we have a snowshoe hare, which is going up the other side of the trail. We have this mouse, which crossed the trail. I've passed vole, I've passed vole tracks, I've passed mouse tracks. we pass probably... We passed what was probably a fisher or a porcupine. If we go purely by probability, then we'd have to say porcupine, though I live far back enough in the woods that it's entirely possible we could come across a fisher. You might notice no sound of industry, no sound of machines, woods all around. This is my home. This is where I live. One of the things I love about it is I get to see a lot of wildlife. That bear is back here. I'm kind of suspecting I might pick up the track of an American black bear because it has been so absurdly warm the past few days it might trigger them to become active. I don't know. Would not be happy about it because at this time of the year their behavior can be unpredictable. But we'll see. Here you can hear the water flowing down there and right here we have picked up the tracks of a snowshoe hare and he was alarmed. Notice the distance between each print group. Somewhere between six and eight feet, except right here, where it's just over a yard apart, and here, and that's because he was starting to jink. But then he decided to carry on, and he ran off into those woods over there. Now what he was alarmed about, right over here, he slows down, and that's because it's getting thicker in there. But I suspect what he was alarmed about was he was crossing this opening, which would have made him vulnerable to any aerial predator, such as an owl. And there are quite a few owls back in these woods, as well as hawks and other predators. Anyway, I showed these tracks because I wanted to show that when a snowshoe hare is alarmed, the print sets don't appear just a foot or two in front of the next print set. When you see it like this, where you got a print set, and then six or seven, eight feet later you have another print set, then it was really moving. I've seen hares all out running at full speed where they leave print sets maybe 10, 11 feet apart. So if you see a print set just two, three feet apart, that's the snowshoe hare or rabbit equivalent of a trot. 
I picked up the tracks of a coyote pack. These are large mature coyotes. We have one set here. We have another set here. That's two. And I could swear I've seen these sets differentiate here and there. Here the coyotes were just starting. This one here launched into a lope. And this one here did a rotary gallop. Just for a short way. Yesterday there was probably water here and they were probably just hurrying across it because they were unsure of the ice. But I could swear right there we have another set there. So off beside the path we have a third coyote. We're moving in a group. They're doubtless hunting. There are wetlands down that way. Beaver Lodge. You see them. You see deer down there at times, other small to medium sized prey. So this is doubtless good hunting grounds for them. They're just being themselves, just doing what coyotes do. Don't worry about coyotes. I know a lot of people are terrified of them. The fear is absurd. In all of North American history, there's only been one probable death of a healthy adult. The odds that coyotes are going to attack a healthy adult, particularly a large male, that doesn't show fear, or just about zero. I wouldn't really honestly worry about a whole pack. I'm a little concerned about Willowis, who's getting silly and falling behind, so I need to get him over here. Come here, dog. Come on, buddy. Come. Good boy. Wouldn't worry too much about Willowis normally, except that uh, he's getting older. Oh, yep, here we are, right here. Really good prints. These are excellent. These are excellent prints of a very large coyote moving in a rotary gallop. Notice the detail here. This is one of the best examples of how to positively ID a canine print that I have ever seen. Notice that white X right there between the pad and toes one and four. That X is definitively canine. If this were a feline print, what we would see is a chevron like that between the space. We'd have the back of the cat's paw looking like that and the toes up here and the space in between would form kind of a wide X. But here with the coyote what we see is an almost perfect X. And that's definitive of canine tracks, unless, unless the track is stretched because the animal's stopping on soft strata, which can warp the negative inside space, you're always going to see this. Cats have the wide X chevron, canines have the true X chevron between the pads, which is the back part of the foot, and toes one and four. Just came across this pretty nice growth here of fairly fresh turkey tails. This is a very, very medicinal small mushroom. They're quite small. Here's my finger in there for scale. But they tend to grow abundantly. You can see them growing all over this log. There are old ones growing up that way. But we had a few days in the last week where warm air, Nova Scotia sticks out in the ocean, and we get, always during the winter, we have Arctic air coming down and warring against warm air coming up from the Bahamas. And sometimes in the dead of winter we can get a few warm days and obviously we, we had a few warm days and it rained and obviously these turkey tails emerged during this time because look at how white that is. These are nice and fresh. So I did not really bring gathering stuff with me. I have my bowie but I'd prefer to do this with a smaller knife. I could put them in my hat, but it's zero degrees. I don't want to take off my hat. Anyway, I have lots of turkey tail at the house. If we're running low, this will be frozen, and it'll be here. I'll come back and get it. I don't expect I'll need it. And if I don't need it, I would rather leave it to set spore so that it can spread itself throughout the woods. So that's always here for future days. But it is definitely good to know it's there. People, you chaga hunters, you should be hunting that stuff, turkey tail, instead of chaga. Chaga has a very long, slow life cycle, 10, 20, 30 years, whatever myths you're hearing in some of the bushcraft circles that I hear these days that 
it spreads easy or you can just nick a tree and rub it on a tree and that makes it grow. It's not the case. Chaga takes 10 to 20, even 30 years to complete its life cycle in a tree. The chaga conch that you see, the black part that people think is chaga, that's just the fruiting body that comes out of the tree. And that fruiting body is sterile until the tree actually dies. Eventually the chaga will kill the tree. If you see chaga in a tree, it will eventually kill that tree, though it can take 10 to 30 years depending on how, how healthy that birch tree is. But Chaga grows very slowly and it only reproduces during the final phase of its life when the tree is dying. That's when it puts out a fertile conch, which you must leave alone. To, because chaga reproduces so slowly, it's very, very susceptible to over-harvesting. Turkey tail reproduces itself abundantly and has a short life cycle, meaning it's very resilient to harvesting. And it is just as healthy, just as medicinal for you as chaga is. If you're going to harvest anything in the woods, harvest that stuff. Much, much better option. Now the size of that boulder over there. That is an erratic. That boulder was dropped here by glaciers that passed through thousands upon thousands of years ago. It was carried in the ice, and as the ice melted, that random boulder was just left behind. Ran out of juice, ran out of battery power back there. I knew the cold was going to kill the batteries pretty quickly. Even though I'm keeping this camera in an inside pocket because it bleeds through and it's so cold today every time I pull out the camera it gets chilled very rapidly. But this also is worth pulling it out. Notice right there on the edge of the ice we have a track. We have prints. And then it leaps. It makes a good leap right to there about four feet and then begins leaping, not climbing. It's actually leaping up this slick ice surface. I apologize. I was coming down to photograph the tracks and slipped a bit on the ice myself, and so I, I overran a couple sets of the prints. This is a rotary gallop that this small animal is doing. Now, I'm miles back in the woods. What do we have here, do you think? Well, let's take a look and see. We have four toes showing. One, two, three, four. We have a claw barely showing there and there and there and not showing there. Barely showing claws. That's important. We have a very interesting pad with a concavity right there. It looks like there are concavities here, but that's hard to tell in a soft substratum. Hard to be sure about that. But notice this. In this nice soft snow, we have this chevron in the negative space between the pad and toes one and four. It goes there, 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 and there's a fair bit of width between. This is a bobcat. And it's worked its way up this little embankment. It's going up the logging road. It actually turns left and goes a bit of the way and then off into the woods. Now, I'm going to put the camera away because this is slippery ground and I cannot afford to damage this camera. It's a very good camera for this kind of work, but also quite expensive. I've come up from the little embankment. Again, I'm sorry about my tracks. There's being in the picture. There's no way to avoid that here. And here are the cat's tracks. He's changing his gait right there. He's going to an asymmetrical trot. He's turning, turning. Now he's in an asymmetrical trot or a very tight rotary gallop and he's continuing on and it goes off into the woods down that way he's going down to the wet ground maybe he's going to fish the ice is broken due to the recent warmth on the brook maybe he's going after some of the small animals such as the muskrats that might live down there or the beavers there's any number of things he could pursue down there in fact probably one of his primary prey in these parts are these many, many rodents that don't have the shelter of the subnivian environment underneath the snow right now. This is also part of tracking. We understand the animal's behavior. We understand the kind of predators and preys and the local relationships. And then we can piece together by dint of sheer probability what was probably going on any time we come across their spore. This is a fairly common track pattern. Some people might recognize this right off the bat. This is the common red squirrel. He's most likely coming from where he nests. 
and going to his cache. Very, very common track pattern. One might notice these small prints, I'm going to put my boot in there for scale, these small prints or print sets have a strong resemblance to the print sets of both rabbits and rodents. And that's because squirrels tend to move a lot like rabbits because they have very strong hind legs. And they have a lot in common with rodents too, so not surprising. He's not in any rush. This is actually you know, red squirrels, most squirrels, red squirrels, all squirrels that I've seen anyway, very high energy animals. They have this kind of energetic hopping gait, very typical of them. Here we have grouse. This is trail. These are tracks from the grouse we were observing in the tree just a little while ago. I don't think it's the same grouse. I think it's a different one because we passed right by here and I didn't see this. So one of the other flock mates walked out here after the one that I spooked flew off a bit. Well, the sun is on the horizon and it's zero, maybe minus five Fahrenheit. And poor old Will-O-Wisp over there is really telling me he wants to head home. He's getting cold. So I think it's about time I call it a day. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Wildwood Ways. Today's episode, just a day of tracking in the woods. Keep watching to learn more about the natural world and the joys of getting to know it. As always, go soft, go gently, and leave no trace. Let's go home, boy. <laughs>